flying into an airport edition references in rain and on clouds can be a challenge. And if you don't play your cards right, you can end up like this. Hello aviators, how are you today? My name is Magnar Nordahl, I'm a captain and instructor on ATAR aircraft. In this video, I will talk about an accident that happened in Tanzania almost a year ago. It involved an ATR-42-500 from Precision Air during a flight to Bukoba, a small airport with no facilities. No instrument approach procedures, no lights, no tower, just a runway, an apron and a terminal building. This is not a problem in good weather. I fly domestic routes in the Maldives and some of the airports do not have instrument approach procedures. One of those airports is Kulodofushi. It has a 1200 meters long runway. Without an instrument approach procedure, we follow instrument flight rules, IFR, down to minimum safe altitude, MSA, which is 1500 feet everywhere in the Maldives. To descend below 1500 feet, the MSA, we must be in visual meteorological conditions, BMC. That means we must be clear of clouds and have at least 5 km visibility. Most of the time the clouds are above 1500 feet and we have no problem finding the airport. But when it's raining it becomes more interesting. In this video there were rain showers around Kolodofushi. When we reached 1500 feet we were still in clouds. So we leveled off and flew towards the airport. When we finally got the runway in sight, we were too close to make a straight in approach, as the final would have been too steep. Thankfully, the visibility around the airport was good, and we could fly overhead and make a standard visual pattern. This video here explains how it's done, and there is a link in the description below. As we landed, a new rain shower came in over the airport, so the timing was perfect. But this video is not about flying in the Maldives. This video is about an accident that happened in an ATR-42 on a visual approach to Bukuba Airport near Victoria Lake when it hit the water with a high rate of descent. Sadly, 19 people, including the pilots, perished in the accident. The goal with accident investigations is that we can learn and prevent similar incidents from happening again. Before we start, I want to specify that this video is based on a preliminary report. While it describes what happened, there are many aspects, like human factors, that are not discussed. Therefore, we know very little about why this accident happened. On the 6th of November 2022, at 0610 local time, an ATR-42500 from Precision Air, registration 5 Hotel, Papa Whiskey Foxtrot, flight number 494, took off from Julius Nyerere International Airport, Dar es Salaam, for a scheduled flight to Bukuba, 550 nautical miles to the northwest. The weather forecast for the route was good, and the estimated time of arrival at Bukuba was 08.25 local time. The alternate airport was Wansa, which will be the destination on their next sector. The aircraft was carrying a crew of four, including two pilots and two cabin crew members, as well as 39 passengers. The pilot in command was the pilot flying. He was 64 years and had a total of 23,515 hours where of 11,929 hours on the aircraft type. He was also the chief pilot of the company. The first officer was 45 years, he had a total of 2,109 hours, where of 1,700 on the aircraft type. 
That means there was an authority gradient in the cockpit. The first part of the flight was routine, and after cruising at flight level 200 for one hour, they started to descend towards Bukoba. They were now in contact with Mansa approach, which reported the weather at Bukoba was good with calm wind, visibility more than 10 kilometers, scattered clouds at 1100 feet, few cumulonimbus at uh, 1300 feet, broken clouds at 8000 feet, temperature 21 degrees, 2.17, and QNH 1018. But uh, this would not last for long. Bukoba Airport has an elevation of 3,784 feet. To the east is Lake Victoria, and to the west are low hills. I do not know the elevation of the terrain near the airport. By using Google Earth, I found the highest terrain to be about 1,400 meters, or 4,600 feet. Neither do I know the minimum altitude the crew is allowed to descend to before they have to be visual with the airport. This procedure must be determined by the company, and since the captain was the chief pilot, he knew the rules. When they got closer to Bukuba, they realized that the weather was less than good. There were heavy rain showers in the area, and after discussing the options, the pilots agreed they should approach the airport from west. This meant that they would land on runway 13. At 0819, they reported to Mwansa approach that they had the feeling sight and were clear to change the Bukuba frequency 118.2. This frequency is not manned, so the crew would send position reports in case there were other aircraft on the frequency. At 0825, the captain told the first officer to look for the runway, and the first officer responded, I am looking. Some seconds later, flap 15 was selected and then the landing gear. They were not visual with the runway, and the captain decided I should descend to 5,000 feet. At 0827, the autopilot was disengaged, flaps were retracted to 0 degrees, and the landing gear retracted. They climbed to 5,500 feet. Then the captain transferred the control to the first officer. I think that was a good decision, as it gave the captain more mental capacity to evaluate the situation. The crew discussed the minimum fuel required for diversion to Mwansa, the alternate airport. And the first officer suggested right away that they should divert to Mwansa. However, the captain decided they should hold. I totally understand this decision. The weather can change, and as long as they have enough fuel, they can wait for the weather to improve. I have done this many times. Sometimes the weather improves and we can land. Sometimes you must divert to the alternate airport. At 08.33, the captain instructed the first officer to head east for Kemudo Bay. Shortly after, they descended to 5,300 feet. One minute later, there was a ground proxy warning system warning. Terrain! Terrain! Pull up! The correct procedure would be to initiate a steep climb, but they did not do that. Maybe they considered the warning to be false. But when you are in instrument meteorological conditions, IMC, you must comply with such warnings, even when you believe they are false. The crew now contacted Mansa approach, which advised them to wait 20 minutes because the visibility at Bukuba was not good. But the crew did not wait. Instead, they descended to 4,900 feet while they were searching for Mozilla Island. This is an old picture taken before the runway was upgraded. Today it's 1,385 meters long and has a surface covered with asphalt. In the background can we see Mozilla Island. As you can see, it is on the extended runway center line and can provide guidance towards the runway. At 0839, the captain asked the first officer to confirm if he had seen the Mozilla Island. The first officer confirmed he had seen it. However, in a period of 78 seconds, they were not able to locate the island. And this is when things started to go really bad. They were encountering heavy rain showers and might have seen glimpses of land or water below. But without seeing the runway, 
or being clear of clouds with at least 5 km visibility. You just don't leave you safe altitude. At 0840, they started to configure the aircraft for landing and started a descent to 4,500 feet. At 08.42 and 16 seconds, the first officer said that he had the runway in sight, and the captain asked, where is the runway? The first officer replied, look below at my 12 o'clock, but the rain is obstructing. The captain said, let's go a bit lower. This was followed by the selection of 4,000 feet altitude, and vertical speed mode was set to minus 400 feet per minute. At 08.42 and 59 seconds, at 900 feet radio altitude and 1.5 nautical miles from the runway threshold, the captain said he had the runway in sight and took control. On a 3 degree slope, which is normal for a final approach, you descended 320 feet per nautical mile. So at 1.5 nautical mile, they should have been at 480 feet. That means they were 420 feet too high, and that meant the vertical path was 5.6 degrees steep. The captain disengaged the autopilot and reduced power to flight idle. The aircraft nose was pitched down, and the aircraft started to descend with 1,700 feet per minute. At 08.43.20 seconds, the radio altimeter called 500. Two seconds later, there was a ground proximity warning. Think rate. Think rate. The vertical speed was still minus 1700 feet per minute. At 08.43 and 26 seconds, the vertical speed was now minus 1300 feet per minute, and the distance to the runway threshold was 0.6 nautical miles. The radio altitude was 300 feet. At this distance, it should have been 200 feet, so now they were just 100 feet above the profile. At 08.43, 28 seconds, there was a ground proximity warning. Think rate. Think rate. And what happened next is puzzling to me. The control column was pushed forward, increasing the descent rate. Five seconds later, there was another sink rate warning. Think rate. Think rate. And the rate of descent increased to minus 1,700 feet per minute. At 08.43.35 seconds, the first officer called lift up captain. One second later, there was a think rate. Pull up. The rate of descent decreased to minus 1500 feet per minute. There was no other response from the captain. At 08.43.38, the first officer shouted, pull up captain. And then the aircraft impacted the water. The aircraft came to rest in the water with the front section under the water and the aft section mostly clear of the water. Survivors told that the forward part of the cabin was immediately filled with water. After the impact, the cabin attendant seated in the rear found herself in the middle of the cabin, still attached to the seat. She released the safety belt, grabbed a life jacket and rushed to the passenger door located at the left side. She opened the door with assistance from a passenger. Most of the survivors evacuated the wreck through this door. The second cabin attendant, who was at the forward station, testified that after the impact, the cabin was immediately filled with water, and it was totally dark in the cabin. She managed to reach one of the emergency exits, open it, and swam out, where fishermen rescued her out of the water. The fishermen had been nearby when the aircraft hit the water, and they helped the survivors. The front section of the cabin was damaged, and many occupants who did not unbuckle themselves from the seatbelt may have suffocated by drowning. The pilots survived the crash, but they were not able to get out in time before they drowned. Next time the cabin crew do the safety briefing, please pay attention to what they tell you. Make sure you know how to release the seatbelt blindfolded, where you find your life vest, and the location of the nearest exit, and how to open it. It takes just a couple of minutes, but may save your life. So why did this happen? 
The preliminary report states that abrupt changes in the weather conditions are common in this area, and the pilots know that. The report suggests that the captain felt he was committed to land at Bukoba. Quote, marginal visibility caused high workload among the crew and may have contributed to the failure to react to train warnings during the final approach. End quote. Flying with visual references in rain is very difficult. The windshield wipers have limited capacity and they are often damaged by wear and tear. The result is reduced visibility and difficulty to see details on the ground. So you lose the 3D impression. When the captain took control, the aircraft was not stabilized. The aircraft was way too high. And that's a very good reason to go around. But the captain continued, so he may not have the same uh, impression as we do when you read the report. Apparently, he believed he could rectify the situation and land the aircraft. After all, he had a lot of experience. With an experience like that, it's easy to be too confident about your abilities. And being in a management role as a chief pilot often brings extra pressure because you feel responsible on behalf of the company. You want to be on time, you want to deliver the product, right? What about the first officer? Why didn't he call for a govern earlier? When you are below stabilization altitude, that is uh, 1,000 feet, and some companies practice 500 feet in visual conditions. So when you're below that altitude and the aircraft is not stabilized, it's the duty of the pilot monitoring to call for a go around. When the first officer finally did that, it was way too late. And that brings us to the very steep authority gradient in the cockpit. The chief pilot has a strong authority because he's the chief pilot and he sets the standard. And that puts a lot of responsibility on the chief pilot. What you tell the other pilot doesn't matter much. It's what you do that matters. You show by doing. So we don't know how was the company culture at that time. But I hope the investigators will look into this when they work on the final report. As I said in the beginning of this video, the goal with accident investigations is that we can learn and prevent similar incidents from happening again. While we still don't know every factor that resulted in this accident, I hope you got an impression of some of the challenges the pilots were facing that day. Finally, I have to say, in every accident report I have covered so far, it was an experienced captain with high authority who messed it up. Input from the first officer was often overruled, or the first officer didn't dare to speak up. Look, we are two pilots. We are both responsible for the safety of the flight. The aircraft, the crew and the passengers. Both of us. So if you're a first officer, do not be afraid to speak up when something is not right. The opposite can be much worse. Okay, thank you for watching, have a wonderful day and happy learning.